So, this is going to be different. Uh, I'm going to address this current period from the standpoint of three persons other than Helen and Lyndon LaRouche who are guided in part by these three. And the issue is here is how does a population which has been subjected to all of this and, and are in this condition, uh, passive, submissive, petty, small, squalid, become transformed such that fundamental and positive change can, can be, become transformed in a, in, 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 and break loose of this. Uh, now, the first of the three that I'm going to go into is, is um, uh, Percy Weiss Shelley, who lived till the late 1820s, who along with Keats uh, was among the last great poets of the English language. It is also most likely that Shelley was also influenced by Schiller, since he has similar conceptions. They both understood, Schiller and Ch Shelley both understood the deepest nature of the soul of being human. The second is the socialist revolutionary and economist Rosa Luxemburg. The third is Friedrich Schiller. I will use these to cover an, an aspect of how a population awakens from this kind of slumber and servitude. Okay, so, the, the key point of reference for Shelley is an incredible essay he wrote called In Defense of Poetry. It's a very powerful, uh, you can get it online and I encourage people to read it. It's not long, but it's extremely powerful. Okay, he defines poetry. Poetry in a general sense may be defined to be the expression of the imagination. And poetry is connate with the origin of man. Man is an instrument over which a series of external and internal impressions are driven, like the alternations of an ever-changing wind over the Aeolian lyre, which move it by the motion of ever-changing melody. But there is a principle within the human being, and perhaps within all sentient beings, which acts otherwise than in the lyre and produces not melody alone, but harmony by an internal adjustment of the sounds uh, or motions that thus excited to the impressions which excite them. So he's, he's talking about, um, it's more, I, I could go on, but he's, this is just in the beginning. So he's talking about quality of the human being, which is in the imagination. It, it, it's the imagination, and it, and, and it, it, it uh, it is uh, 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 so I'll go to another section. But poets, or those who imagine and express the indestructible order, are not only the authors of language and of music, of the dance and architecture and, and statu uh, statuary and painting. They are the institutors of laws and the founders of civil society and the inventors of arts of life and the teachers who draw into a certain propinquity with the beautiful and the true, the partial apprehension of the agencies of the invisible world, which is called religion. Hence, all original religions are allegorical or susceptible to allergy, and like Janus, have a double face of false and truth. Poets, according to the circumstance of the age and nation in which they appeared, are ca were called, in their earlier epics of the world, legislators or prophets, a poet essentially comprises and unites both these characters. So he's saying that religions are both true and false in the sense that they're true in the sense of an allegorical quality, but they're false in another sense because, because but without it, them being allegorical, they would not have the poetic power to touch the uh, imagination um, of, 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 of the population of, of their of their subjects. So this is this is a very important concept here. <coughs> and then he says, a poet participates in the eternal, the infinite, and the one, as far as relates to his conceptions, time and place, and numbers are not. 
grammatical forms which express the moods of time and the difference of persons and distinction of place are conversable with respect to the highest poetry without injuring it as poetry. And the chorus is Aeschylus and the book of Job. In Dante's Paradise would afford even more other writings. Examples of the fact of uh, and what he says about Dante, Dante is 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 takes humanity from the Middle Ages into the modern. He bridges the modern age, he bridges the Middle Ages with the modern age through his poetry. Through his poetry. Now uh, I'm going to read you the, the most powerful section of this, which is his last paragraph. And this is where this is uh, this is where the uh, it points to. Okay. What am I saying? The most unfailing herald, companion, and follower of the awakening of a great people to work a beneficial change in opinion or institution is poetry. At such periods, there is an accumulation of the power of communicating and receiving intense and impassioned conceptions respecting man and nature. The persons in whom this power resides may often, as far as regards many portions of their nature, have little apparent correspondence with that spirit of good of which they are the ministers. But even while they deny and abjure, they are yet compelled to serve the power which is seated on the throne of their own soul. It is impossible to read the compositions of the most celebrated writers of the present day without being startled with the electric life which burns within their words. They measure the circumference and sound the depths of human nature with a comprehensive and all-penetrating spirit. And they are themselves perhaps the most sincerely astonished at its manifestations. For it is less their spirit than the spirit of the age. Poets are the hierophants of an unapprehended inspiration, the mirrors of the gigantic shadows which futurity casts upon the present, the words which express what they understand not, the trumpets which sing to battle and feel not what they inspire, the influence which is moved not but moves. Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Okay. Now, um, he's referring to the period he's living in, which had just seen the uh, French Revolution, the American Revolution, the tremendous outpouring of German cl uh, classical music, uh, this, tr this all coming out of a period that was still essentially feudal and, and imperial. So this is what he's referring to in terms of the age that he's in, the spirit of the age he's in. However, that spirit is still with us. That spirit from that same age is still with us, and I'll, I'll get into that. Now, uh, he said, the poetry of Danton may be considered as the bridge over the stream of time which unites modern and ancient world. Okay. <coughs> so, um, so, so the world has been in a revolution since the Renaissance. Uh, contemporary to Shelley, of course, is what I described. And by the way, Shakespeare had been obscured completely not long after uh, James the first came in. He was revived by this in this period, the late 1700s, by the networks of, that, of what Shelley was a part of. So Shakespeare was, for 150 years, Shakespeare was not, was not performed, and the oligarchy didn't like Shakespeare, and they wanted uh, to promote, you know, pastoral, you know, stuff and whatever. Now, this underlying classical revival of Shakespeare and the classical German culture coming out of the Ren later, earlier Renaissance is the substratum of the soul today of Einstein, Bernatsky, and Lyndon LaRouche. Lyndon LaRouche is definitely a 
uh, a throwback, on a, uh, a genius, but a throwback to that period. For today, you cannot be a great scientist if you are not a poet, by the way. Uh, Bernowski and, and Einstein are great poets. So the period we are entering in is unprecedented and, and is this poetic tradition embodied in LaRouche is being met with other poetic traditions. There are other poetic traditions parallel to the Renaissance. One is the Chinese. And we're talking about a Renaissance within the Chinese culture, influenced by the West, but which um, uh, is, is a Confucian Renaissance. And it's parallel. You heard about that. You have a, a secondary Renaissance coming off the German Renaissance within the Russian culture. What, what Putin is Putin has done is revived the highest quality of Russian culture that existed prior to the Communist Revolution without feudalism. And he's merged that. So this is very important. And there's a level of, 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 of quality of culture in Russia that existed, but it was only in the very, in the upper, upper class. And then you have an Indian, which I'm not familiar with, but I know Modi himself is a poet, and I know that he's embodying a culture which has thousands of years in opposition to the British liberalism. So I know I know that, but I don't know all the details of how this works. But he is a poet. He's written a lot of poetry. And he does have a poetic uh, inspiration. And what you can see in all three of them is that they are governed by an, uh, a spirit that is completely outside the period of, uh, that we're living in. They're governed by a spirit that goes back to a different time, but a different world. It's a poetic world, and they're governed by that spirit. And that spirit, a uh, poetic spirit, is governing their act activity. It's governing what they do. It's not empire. It's not um, the will to power. It's not ambition. It's not the typical things that, that are in this level here. It's coming from here. And uh, between, the, okay, so between these three, anyhow, and, uh, and they can not be understood otherwise. This is me making this assertion. You cannot understand these people unless you understand that they are, that they are being driven by a poetic power. A poetic power that's agopic and that's has its basis in earlier culture, but they're also creating as, as they are going. And Lyndon LaRouche is the epitome of this. Lyndon LaRouche and Helga LaRouche are the epitome of this. Uh, and between all four, including LaRouche, a revolutionary spirit is coming into the world. They are being driven by this revival, which is a new spirit of the age, and with each crisis they face, they must rise to a creative occasion in the imagination of the future world to creatively deal with the crisis that, uh, that the satanical, destructive, and collapsing qualities of the oligarchy, uh, quality of evil that the oligarchy represents, which is furiously opposing us. We are in such a period, but not, and it's not a local period. It's not in this area, it's not in that area, it's global. And if we can avoid a nuclear war, it will come to our local shores of Canada as we here, in our local capacity, are about to try to affect. Now, so that's my, my going into sh to the question of Shelley, the, the, the poetic principle, the, the unacknowledged legislators of, of the world. Okay, So this is very important, that that's what's guiding the spirit of these individuals. It's not a spirit that you can put in uh, words. It's something more profound, something more profound than words. Now, now I'm going to go into uh, Rosa Luxemburg. Rosa Luxemburg came from the same circles in Poland, which was under Russian uh, imperial occupation in the, in, the eight, in the late 1800s. And she comes from the same circles as Madame Curie. And uh, she is one of the only two socialist leaders of that period, spanning the, the period of Karl Marx all the way to Lenin and Trotsky and beyond, who 
who, the other one was Suarez in, in French. <coughs> she is one of the only two socialists who understood or understands that what is called capitalism is really global financial imperialism. That's an imperial system. It's, it's an imperial system based on looting and, and not based on men and not based on capitalism as people understand. And second, she develops a concept of the mass strike. This is very important, the concept of the mass strike. Her view of, 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 her, her view of revolution is that one must prepare for the moment when the population, which at one moment appears to never have any capability of opposition, to rise up at the next moment. Like the French Revolution, the Mexican Revolution, the American Revolution, the, the Chinese Revolution of the 20th century. And that these revolutions become possible when the old feudal order or imperial order collapses because it is unable to maintain itself because it has looted to the point of destroying the basis of its continuing to function. When that time comes, according to Rosa Luxemburg, the general population becomes open to new conceptions and ideas as well as discovering in themselves, if only temporarily, the, the power of thought that they, or they, they did not know, but which they had within them. So this is very important. The idea of a mass strike, that you go from a period where people are just absolutely, and to a percolation, where they're in, you know, where they want to know what's going on, what's happening, uh, they, the social process starts to change, and all, you have this mass process going on. And, and then things go completely, um, it, uh, things change completely. For the good, sometimes for not for the good. Now this third person we're gonna, I'm talking about is Friedrich Schiller, who wrote the Aesthetical Letters, which Charles Gracia has gone through with people. Uh, on the issue of the French Revolution versus the American Revolution, where the French Revolution uh, ended in the carnage, and the American Revolution ended in, 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 in ultimately in a constitution and, and, and progress to some degree. Now, I'm not going to go into that aspect of it, but Schiller develops the concept that degenerate educated classes, cultured degenerate classes, who have lost their feelings and have become overdetermined in the faculty of intellect and are arrogant, degenerate, and lose a sense of connection to the rest of humanity versus the savage whose feelings they're very much in touch with, but feelings are based and not yet made noble. And, and, and therefore, the poet, the art, is, has, is there to educate the emotions of the savage. And, possibly get, get the others to get in touch with it, but that's a lot harder. It's easier to educate the emotions of the savage than it is to, to uh, get the uh, degenerate educated classes to have, to have, you know, to have, to get beyond their ego. So, um, now, so the idea is that, um, is that when the order collapses, if the savage is, is not able to latch on to a principle that is noble, that is beautiful through art, then it can be, uh, extreme excesses can occur. And um, Shakespeare did not do his plays for the oligarchy. He did the plays to elevate and create a sense of, a, a, a profound sense of tragedy in the, in the general population, to get them to conceive of a tragedy, to get the average, um, not yet literate uh, worker, workers in London to actually experience a tragedy is a profound emotional shift for these people like in, the, in these tragedies and histories. Or get them to conceive of a historical process with, 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 the, uh, with the histories. Now from a Schillerian standpoint, we are entering a period like all those other periods where the population enters an undetermined state. When the old order is going under, and they're in, this, they're in an undetermined state. And now, is this, is this kind of process going on in Canada? Yes. 
Is it going on in every part of the world? Yes. You see it in every part of the world. And you see, the you see it in the response to the Belt and Road Initiative in all these parts of the world. It's just tremendous. I don't think they had any idea they were going to get this response when the, when the Chinese put this out. It's just, it just electrifying. That is, the map, that is a process where cynical third world leaders and, and people who just lived under this colonial system forever and accustomed, acclimatized themselves are all of a sudden realizing there's a, there's a chance for something different. And, and this is having an electric effect. Now, so how is this manifesting itself here? Well, one aspect of the manifestation uh, is that is the behavior of the Trudeau administration, the Trudeau government. They are following the Obama script, and their um, their act actions and behavior is, is so outrageous and so self-destructive that, and they are discrediting themselves totally. And they're doing that without realizing that they're discrediting themselves totally in the eyes of the population with this he, she, he, it, whatever, whatever they're doing. And in both Canada and the U.S., you have a degenerate elite that is completely out of touch with reality of the coming in of the new spirit, as well as the collapse of their system of plunder and false values. Even in spite of what you saw, what you saw with the uh, media, this process is universal in both Canada and the U.S., and it is far more advanced in the U.S. The election of Donald Trump was the manifestation of the beginning of a mass strike process in the Rosa Luxemburg and Shillerian sense. It was. It's totally unexpected, totally incomprehensible <coughs> to have occurred. If you had predicted something like that, you could not. It's, it's a manifestation of this process. It is my belief that Donald Trump is not understood because he is driven by a poetic spirit, but he has no one to discuss this with. It's something going on in, deep inside him. Now, I could be wrong. This is a, about this question. But I think he is driven by that. And he has very uh, limited um, way to articulate and communicate this and make this more... Uh, socialized, uh, and therefore he may not fully understand that he is being driven by a, a poetic quality, which we talk about in, in, in what I quoted from Shelley, where they may not know what, that, but the spirit of the age is, is, is getting them. Now it is coming to Canada, and of course the behaviorship of the leadership of Canada is completely embarrassing to any observer. Nor does this mean a nostalgia for the likes of Harper. We are entering in Canada as part of the global process a uncharted and unprecedented period. Though we may see no visible manifestation yet emerge to respond to this other than what, what we're doing our, ourselves, uh, there may be other processes going on that we will probably link up with. To our knowledge, something will be emerging. And that's that which emerges from this increasingly under um, that which emerges increasingly from this situ from this situation may not even, the people who may emerge may not even know that the poetic principle is thriving, but something will emerge. In the U.S., we are more positioned to shape the process, like the Keisha Jones campaign or. Um, Keisha Rogers, excuse me, Keisha Rogers campaign and others. Uh, and that's part of what our pamphlet is for, is to shape a process that is going on. So the ideas in our pamphlet will circulate and they could very well crystallize a process, even though the circulation may be very minimal, it may very well uh, crystallize the process into a new paradigm here in Canada. Okay, so now, how is this all looking within the global context of the most recent developments? Uh, the Scribble Affair to shape a continued, if not um, increasing, division of the world and forestall Europe, especially from going into the Belgian Road, uh, has failed. 
The city of London, the empire, all of its assets, especially in the U.S., were mobilized. Instead of them succeeding, we have uh, a massive diplomatic counteroffensive now going on by the by uh, the Russians. And two major cabinet officials in the U.S. have been fired: Tillerson and McMaster. Uh, but, uh, Trump called those who oppose having good relations with Russia as stupid. <coughs> and McMaster, who's still the National Security Advisor until April 9th, basically gave a speech at the Atlantic Council where he basically called himself stupid. What? No, I'm serious. It, he, it, he, he, you know, he, he, he's, in, he's, he's indicating that he knows he was, he's being called stupid by the, by the president. And, and, and Tillerson is the same thing. Now, even though many were mobilized by the, Brit, uh, by the British, they, they unprecedentedly did not achieve what they wanted. As a result, their power in this domain has declined. Ninety-five nations met in Moscow at the security conference there with a very big Chinese delegation, including the Chinese defense minister, who was very public and very bluntly said, we support Russia's interest Totally <coughs> militarily. That's that has big, never been said by. That's us. a big statement. Yeah, no, that has never been said. Okay. And at the security conference, all the nations present discussed the preparing for the next wave of terrorism, since much of the mercenaries have left the Middle East and are going all over the world, either as sleepers or into various other areas, to prepare for Britain's next round of warfare against the, the nation state. Okay. So, the other last thing is that the British have now come out in their own name. They cannot hide behind the United States anymore. And so, they are now out in the open. And that's very important. So, so this brings me to the next aspect. The City of London system, this crowd is now pushing through their U.S. counterparts a trade war with China. Trump is playing with it too. Now, China is making it very clear they will not back down. For every dollar of trade war, they're going to respond with an equal amount. And if necessary, they will dump dollar uh, treasuries. That is the end of the U.S. So basically, the Chinese are saying, we want to work with you, we want to help you, we want to help you solve this problem, but this is not the way to do it. Okay? And they're making that very clear. And Wall Street is saying, no, you will not allow the Chinese to come in and build infrastructure. You will not allow the Chinese to build factories. You will not allow the Chinese to convert their debt, U.S. debt that they're holding, into facilities to finance the development of the United States. No way, Jose, are they saying that. So now we have this crisis where the Chinese are telling Trump, we have a way out. And the Trump is getting hit from the other side saying, no way, Jose, you're not going to do that. We don't want the Chinese taking over. So this is, this is where we are. Okay, so the Chinese are offering these options. It means Trump has to take on Wall Street at some point, or he has to go down. And the Republican crazies that are simple-minded are not helping. This is, uh, and this is part of the problem. And this is part of the problem of, 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 of the lack of culture among these Republicans. In other words, they're savage. There's a savage quality to them. Huh. <laughs> so the effect of the trade war between the U.S. and China uh, will, if, it, if, it, if it, is, it hasn't really gotten going yet, but when it, if, if it does, Canada is going to be on the receiving end. Who's Christia Freeland wants to, a war on China. Right, so that's really going to be very helpful to Canada to have a war on China in the middle of a, of a trade war. You know. So, and with the U.S. collapsing, it's not very helpful to Canada. So, it is, it is hoped that the crisis that this is creating will further force changes in the U.S. And um, so we're entering that second phase of the crisis, which is the financial crisis. The, 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 the big, the big, uh, threat right now is corporate debt. The rising interest rates has created a crisis in corporate debt. Uh, top people are, are saying the stock market is going to go 40% under. 
uh, very soon, and so on and so forth. So there's all of this talk going on. But but I'm saying that this is this is this is what what uh, we're looking at. So fundamentally, uh, there, while you saw what Phil presented as the echo chamber. More and more people are rejecting the echo chamber. But that doesn't solve their problem, as Phil laid out. They, they go off in these other, <laughs> other areas. So this is why, um, but, but nonetheless, there, there is a process going on of a rejection of the existing system. And uh, the question is, what, what will this undetermined state in the, in the, in the population uh, adhere to what? Did, what do they pick up? Where do they go? And so, um, so I, that was not a very long presentation. So I'm going to stop there and open it up.